What will it take to bring calm to Kenya? The former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan has got key leaders talking, but he's found no way to stop the violence. In the meantime, thousands of Kenyans are too scared to live in their homes and more than 750 have been killed, often hacked to death or burnt alive. And the carnage has carried on for weeks now. Some of the most horrific has been in the Rift Valley. That is where Yvonne Ndege travelled to, the town of Navasha. The main road linking Naivasha to the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Young men are forced to move the barricades that made it impossible for those fleeing violence to escape. Some are reluctant at first, then out of fear, heed the call. The army must get the security situation under control, which means being able to move freely. Some people grab the opportunity to loot a chemist whose owner came from the wrong tribe. The sound of sporadic gunfire echoes all around. Nobody knows what's going on and they're not willing to hang around to find out. The, the canisters being thrown inside our houses. David witnessed some of the fighting and says it took place between President Kibaki's Kikuyu community and Luos, the ethnic group of opposition leader Raila Odinga. Denying his own involvement, he says that after the fighting, Luos fled and then anti-Kikuyu police started to target them. We are Kikuyus and they are doing this because we are Kikuyus. Since the, 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 the reinforcement, they know the police who are coming, they are Nandis and Luos. And it seems like they are targeting one tribe, and that is the Kikuyus. Because we don't have the, that much of Luos and Nandis around, uh, now it's like we, are, we, we, we fail to understand why are they doing this. Is it because we are Kikuyus or it's something, it's, this is not something political. Is that what we, you suspect? It's because yeah, we, are, we suspect, yeah, it is being, we are being targeted because we are Kikuyus. So it's something uh, tribal. He then shows us some of the houses he claims were attacked by police. But along the way, this. The body of a dead Lua man apparently set upon by a mob of club-wielding Kikuyus. We're then swiftly taken to a house nobody wants to see. Now this is the scene of one of the worst incidents of violence to take place in Naivasha. The allegation is that there were a mob of about 100 people behind that gate trying to get in to attack a group of Luos who live in this compound. Now these people allegedly ran through this door and into this room. Of course there would have been a door here at the time and they barricaded themselves uh, inside. A fire broke out, they all lost their lives and it's just not clear how that fire actually started. The police say the people inside were burned to death by Kikuyus, but the locals say the deaths were accidental. Among the different ethnic communities, there's claim and counterclaim about who's attacking who and why. But the vast majority of people leaving and those who have left already are from the Luo community. Those unable to get away are taking up refuge here. It's a maximum security prison, but the doors are now open the internally displaced and prisoners living side by side. At least 3,000 people are stuck here and the number grows by the hour. The people of Naivasha are angry and suspicious and so are turning on each other. Yvonne Dege, Al Jazeera, Naivasha, Kenya. Now a tense standoff in northwestern Pakistan where dozens of school children were taken hostage has ended peacefully. Initially, up to 250 students had been held by the gunmen who had fled to the school after a gunfight with police in the town of Banu. Many were released during negotiations. The final 25 walked free when the gunmen were allowed to surrender to tribal elders. It was said to have been a spontaneous demonstration by residents of southern Beirut, angry over power cuts. By the end of Sunday night, six people were dead, security forces were blamed and Hezbollah was demanding an investigation. Rula Amin has more now from Beirut. At a Shayah neighborhood in southern Beirut, grief was mixed with anger. Ahmad Hamza was the first to be killed in Sunday clashes. For the people here, his killing was unwarranted. We are deprived of everything. No electricity, no water, no work. If we take to the street to express our despair, they shoot at us. It was a peaceful protest, says this woman. 
It's our right to protest. Is it forbidden to express ourselves? Isn't this supposed to be a democratic country? Calm returned to Beirut streets in the morning, but that didn't alleviate the anxiety many feel. The Lebanese army was considered the last institution left in Lebanon, still neutral and still functional. Who wants to draw the army into bloody street confrontations? Newspaper headlines read. Hezbollah demanded a quick, serious investigation. If it was the army who shot at the protesters, they want to know why. And if it wasn't the army, they want the army to say so, bluntly and clearly. Witnesses had reported snipers in civilian clothes firing at the protesters. The March 14th pro-government camp held the opposition responsible and said Syria is destabilizing Lebanon once again. We think uh, that uh, Syria is not a uh, stranger to that because uh, uh, behind this uh, they uh, want to, to show a, a very false idea about Lebanon that uh, in Lebanon there is still uh, a confessional problem between Muslims and Christians. The army's involvement takes special significance as the army commander-in-chief, General Michel Suleiman, is being nominated to become Lebanon's next president part of a larger deal to resolve the political crisis. General Michel Suleiman acquired a good part of his credibility for his ability to keep the army at bay away from Lebanon's political divisions and for the army's role in ending sectarian clashes that threatened Lebanon in the past two years. Sunday evening clashes undermined the army's role and the credit its commander had acquired. If Suleiman's nomination for the presidency is undermined, that would be a blow to Arab mediation efforts to reach a resolution to Lebanon's crisis. Sunday's fires have been put out, but the issues are still burning. Rula Amin, Al Jazeera, Beirut. Just one crossing point remains open now on the border between Egypt and Gaza, and fewer and fewer Palestinians are making the journey. Those that do are stocking up, as they have been now for six days, because it's likely that point too will be closed within a day. On the Egypt-Gaza border, John Cookson sent this report. Six days after holes were blown in the border, the bulldozers are moving in to seal it again. Amid frenzied scenes, Palestinians are perhaps tasting their last days of freedom as Cairo slowly closes the door. Well, this is the Saladin Cross in absolutely chaotic scenes here today. Palestinians on foot and in vehicles able to cross quite easily without any papers at all. We're going to try and walk forward now. Well, we've just easily walked into the Egyptian side now. Absolutely no problem at all. Uh, this is uh, Rafa in Egypt. One economic study group estimates Palestinians have spent a staggering $150 million here and at the regional capital, Al Arish, in the last week. Today, the hot selling item, satellite receivers at $40 each. Back on the Gaza side of the border, clear visual signs the Egyptians are preparing to stop the flow. Palestinians are hoping a meeting this week between Egypt's President Mubarak and the Palestinian leadership will find a solution. We want President Mubarak and Abbas to help us to find a solution for the border crossing. We suffer so much from the siege. We wish the border would stay open. The Palestinians are really tired of this. Their situation is really bad. Six days ago, when the border was first breached, Gaza's Palestinians said they felt like birds being freed from a cage. Well, now the cage door is closing again. John Cookson, Al Jazeera, in Rafa. A five-day-old ceasefire appears to have broken down in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Tutsi rebels and Mai Mai fighters have clashed. Reports say fighting broke out near villages west of Goma. Both sides blame the other for starting the new hostilities. French court has sentenced six charity workers to eight years in prison after they were found guilty of trying to abduct more than 100 children from Chad. The six were originally sentenced to eight years hard labour by a Chadian court and were then transferred to France under a deal between the two countries. The aid workers were stopped attempting to fly 103 African children out of Chad. They said they were Darfur orphans being taken to European homes.
Now, some 400 anti-President Musharraf protesters uh, were there for President Musharraf's arrival at the British Prime Minister's residence.